that's frost. A few weeks ago, I shared that Heath and Lindsay Martin traveled to Kansas to hunt during a cold front. The first afternoon of that hunt, he tagged an old buck they called High and Tight. The following morning, Lindsay tagged a large eight pointer they called 45. After tagging out in Kansas, they returned to their home state of Arkansas and waited for a good opportunity to hunt the family farm. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Reconyx, Trophy Rock, Eagle Seed, Nikon, Winchester, Lacrosse Footwear, Flatwood Natives, Morel Targets, Caldwell Shooting Supplies, Hooks, Custom Calls, Montana Decoy, Summit Tree Stands, Drake Non-Typical Clothing, RTP Outdoors, Yamaha, Fourth Arrow, Scent Crusher, Mossy Oak Properties of the Heartland, Hunter's Blend Coffee, Motorola Lighting Solutions, Scorpion Venom Archery, Code Blue, Decode, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. Last spring, Heath and Lindsay decided to use prescribed fire to restore an area that hadn't been a food plot in many years. They wanted to get rid of the weeds and get it ready for a spring plant. After the prescribed fire, Heath planted most of it in Eagle Seeds 4-H soybeans and left one end to grow up in native grasses for cover. In timber country, having quality cover and food can make for some great hunting. With the beans doing good, during the summer, Heath and Lindsay decided to put a redneck ghillie blind overlooking the plot. During the late summer, Heath drilled a portion of the plot with Eagle Seeds Fall Buffalo Blend. This created the perfect combination of standing soybean pods and greens, a great attraction for whitetails no matter the conditions. The pods tend to attract deer on the cooler days when they're seeking high energy foods and the greens tend to attract deer on warmer days. After Heath returned from Kansas, a favorable wind was forecast for the family farm. Another chance to tag a buck. Well, hey guys, today's October the 19th and as you can hear right now, it's actually raining pretty hard. I'm in a redneck ghillie blind uh, overlooking some eagle seed soybeans and some broadside blend and buffalo blend kind of drilled around the edges of it but we're in about a three acre field there's probably two acres of food plot we got a pond to our left and we're actually here on our home farm in Arkansas uh, this is the first time I've hunted in Arkansas this year and tomorrow morning is opening day of muzzleloader season so we'll probably try to hunt here again in time, time or two but we're after a buck we call Red Man. He's a great big, nice, wide 10 point. Probably a 150 type deer for here. That's a really big deer. It's the first time we ever got pictures of him. For some reason, he had a great big swollen jaw. I figured he had an abscess or something, and then a couple of days later, he came in and it was gone. So I don't know if he got bit by a snake and got over it or what it was. But anyway, he had a great big old puffed up jaw, so we called him Red Man, and it kind of stuck. He's been in here. He's still around. He's a big, nice deer. I'd love to see that deer. Mr. Squiggles has been here daily. I mean, we will likely see that deer. I don't know that I will shoot him, but we will likely see him, at least I hope. Hopefully we get some good footage of him. I know it's kind of been long-winded, and I'm kind of waiting on the rain here, so. We're gonna kick the camera around here and be quiet for a while and see if we can get into some action. Heath's hunch that the deer would be active was correct. A doe and a fawn came out and started feeding in the beans. Not long after, several young bucks entered the pot. These deer were hammering the pods. As Heath was enjoying the show, he spotted a large buck entering the pot. 
It was Red Man. Unfortunately, Red Man caught heat off guard and walked through the shot opportunity. Once Red Man passed, all he could do was watch the buck feed. Right at dark, another large buck entered the field and started feeding with Red Man. He calls this buck Mr. Squiggles. Soon after that, Arkansas's muzzleloader season opened and Heath was able to hunt several mornings and afternoons. He saw a lot of critters. Several days later, there was a favorable wind to hunt out of the redneck blind overlooking the plot they'd established using prescribed fire. This was the same location where he tagged a buck they called Spindletop Jr. last season. Deer were active that morning, feeding both on the pods and the greens, but no hit list buck. The following morning, Heath returned to the blind. Not long after the sun was up, two does entered the plot. He noticed something had the doe's attention. It was Red Man. <laughs> Due to all the smoke, he couldn't tell if his shot was true, so he quickly grabbed his Nikons and tried to spot Red Man. Put the smoke on hold, Red Man. I'll have to get out of the line and go take a look at him here in a minute. Well, here's a buck we call Red Man. It's a buck I thought I wanted to kill this year, and I actually had an encounter with him three or four days ago with my bow. I wasn't able to get a shot at him. This is actually the spot where I killed Spindle Top Junior last year. Got in the blind and heard deer fighting before daylight, and when it got light, there was young bucks and does in the food plot all morning. And then about 7.50, this guy came cruising back through and came through the beans and walked out in the open of the little green food plot there. Put his head down and started feeding, so I took that opportunity to make a good shot and dropped the hammer on the old muzzle loader and he ran right out here 60 yards in the grass and fell over. So wrapped up another successful hunt here on the farm in Arkansas. Well done, Heath. Your work in improving the habitat, paired with your excellent hunting skills, has paid off once again. Earlier this year, we created a new plot I named Pops because my dad enjoyed hunting in that area. My good friends David and Brenton cleared that plot for me, and not long after they finished, Tyler drilled in Eagle Seed 4-H soybeans. The Pops plot primarily runs east and west. Once the plot was planted and the beans were germinating, we placed a Reconyx camera in the east end to see if deer were using that area. 
we were pleased to find that that corner was a hot travel corridor. Multiple bucks frequented pops throughout the summer. We were regularly getting pictures of an old buck we call Swoops, a hit lister we call Ringer 8, and a buck that has great potential we call Slingshot. Based on all this activity, it was a no-brainer to hang some summits in the east end of Pops. Daniel picked a tree and hung some stands well before hunting season. The stands were hung to be hunted during a strong south or west wind. That way we could enter from the east without alerting deer in the area. This plot was designed as a feeding location. A feeding location simply means it's large enough to produce a lot of forage and hopefully won't be over browsed. That's compared to small hidey ho or stationary plots, which are primarily designed as hunting locations. Larger plots can be difficult to bow hunt because deer can easily enter and exit out of bow range. During the late summer, we planted Eagle Seeds Fall Buffalo Blend in Pops. Then Owen, one of our interns, spread trophy rocks, plot rock, in one portion of the plot. Plot rock is taken from the same mine as trophy rock. Ground up really fine, clay added in, it still has the 65 plus trace minerals that plants can easily absorb and make available to the deer. Not only is this good for deer, but it makes for healthier forage. It's an easy win-win. During the early part of bow season, multiple bucks continued frequenting pops. Last summer, we had seen a buck we call frost not far from pops. We believe Frost was likely spending a majority of his time on neighboring properties. After summer bachelor groups of bucks break up, it's very common for some of the bucks to use a different portion of their home range. We were pleasantly surprised when we got a video a frost using one of our code blue scrapes in an area we call Blackberry Patch on October 19th. On October 22nd, Frost walked through one of our small Heidi Hole food plots and used a code blue mock scrape we'd established a few weeks earlier. It seems Frost may have returned to using this portion of his home range. Recently, while going through some camera cards, Daniel picked up a trend that seemed bucks were cruising the downwind side of food plots scent checking for does. November 1st, Frost showed up in front of our camera sites we call Crossroads, then at the Blackberry Patch Scrape, headed right for the Pops food plot. Knowing this pattern based on our truck cameras and that several does were using the Pops food plot, Daniel thought there was a good chance Frost or another mature buck would cruise on the downwind side, scent checking the area. So Daniel and Owen decided to go hunt the summits they'd hung earlier and this would be the first time that location was hunted. Well, it's November 2nd, and it's just a beautiful afternoon. It's that time of the year that we all just love to be out in the woods. Got a west wind blowing our scent, kind of right past us, got a little north in it, which I like because we're kind of threading that needle. The game plan is this, the food plot runs east and west. 
for the most part. This time of year, bucks are looking for those first receptive does. These bucks are gonna to wanna to cruise on the downwind side of this plot, not only to visually look out and see if there's deer out here, but also to scent check it. Suspect that deer are gonna kinda of loop around the bottom side of this plot, and we're gonna be right here within bow range. That's the plan, we'll see if it works. Stay tuned. Not long after they were up, Daniel spotted movement coming through the timber. What's really neat about that bobcat encounter is that cat just went him by his nose, just like deer do. He was cutting across the wind, coming from the south to the north, cutting that wind with that little north hitting him there in the nose so he knew what was up ahead of him. He sneaked right through the bottom side of this food block. There's a good chance that deer will be doing the same thing. A while later, several deer entered the west end of the plot. These deer were well out of bow range, but it was early in the afternoon and it was great to see deer were active. Get a lot of questions if we blind grunt. It depends on the situation. This afternoon, I'm not gonna blind grunt at all. The reason being is this. We got a west wind and we're sitting at the eastern side of this food plot. We really can't see a lot back behind us where all our wind is going. If I blind grunt, a lot of that sound is going to be carried back to the east. And if a buck does hear the grunt, there's a good chance he's going to try to circle around the edge of this food plot on the downwind side of us. And we may never see him. So I would rather not grunt unless I see a buck out in the food plot and I need him to come to me. That's how I'm going to play the grunting game this afternoon. That's a good one. That's a shooter. That's frost. That's frost, isn't it? Are you rolling? He's doing, he's right here in front of him. You want it? That's frost. he was cutting across on this lower side looking up scent checking for sure up here on the, the main part of the field sneaking through this bottom side but it came from the north we thought they were going to come from the south but it doesn't matter because <laughs> frost 
this down. Frost is frost is down. Oh my word, dude. Well, oh and I have packed up, we're on the ground. I'm excited to get on the ground and go look for frost, but it's a little hike get back in here. We're gonna take our gear, drop it off at the Yamaha, and then drive around and come back. So that's what we're gonna do. Give him a little extra time, just in case he needs it. I don't think he does. I think he actually went down not too far out of the plot. I sure hope so, because I can't wait to get my hands on him. So this is gonna be a long hike, a lot longer than it was getting in here. But, We've given him about an hour and a half, which I think is plenty of time based on the shot. I can't wait any longer, so I'm gonna turn on the Motorola and go pick up this green knock out here in the field. Blood, there's blood. That looks like good blood. Blood there, now we're going. I love, I love, trailing to these brassicas, those big, those big leaves sure help. There he goes. This is where he turned, this is where he went up and now he starts turning back this way because there's blood there. There's blood there, blood there. There's the arrow out of the other side right here. So we're about 10 yards from where we found the, the last six inches of the arrow, if, if that, and they have just found the rest of the arrow, which I saw coming through them on the offside and I didn't know when it would work out, but here it is. Dead meat, dead meat's doing the job. There's a lot of good blood through here. So we're gonna keep on, keep on going. Thick long blood. Dude, he's spewing, look at all that blood. Oh my word. He's right there, you see him? We're maybe 80 yards from the plot. He's down! Oh my word! Whew. Dude, yes! I don't even know what to say, man. It's just been an incredible night. Such a blessing. Such a blessing. We've been going hard the past couple of weeks, and it is fun and a blessing to just slow down and have this moment with this deer. Nice job, Daniel, in both the strategy and the shot. I'm also very proud of Owen. Owen had never filmed hunts or ran a camera much before he started his internship. Owen did a great job filming this hunt and is doing a great job assisting us with the wildlife and habitat management here at the Proven Grounds. There are a lot of lessons from Daniel's hunt. Just because you're not getting pictures of a buck on trail cameras doesn't mean he's disappeared from the property or that he won't be back. I also wanted to point out how stained frost tarsal glands were. This is common this time of year, especially on mature bucks bucks this time of year will rub their tarsal glands together while urinating on them. They commonly do this while working a scrape. Tarsal glands serve as a scent wick and hold that scent as the buck travels through an area. Research at the University of Georgia several years ago showed it's not just a urine smell but other interactions on the tarsal glands that produces the odor. As we all know, scent is a huge part of communication in the deer world. Daniel did a great job of planning a strategy that was appropriate for this stage of the rut. Often, hunting strategies or locations need to be changed during the pre-rut compared to the rut or post-rut. I recently used the same strategy and planned my hunt based on the stage of the rut. That hunt was a couple of weeks ago and it was during the early stages of the pre-rut. Bucks were kind of checking out does, but not very aggressively. It was a rainy afternoon, so I selected a redneck blind overlooking a fairly large food plot 
and placed a couple of Montana doe decoys not far in front of the blind. During that hunt, a nice three-year-old buck, about 120 yards away, stepped out of timber and not long after, locked on the decoys. It was clear watching this buck that he was paying attention to the decoys and started working toward them. The buck ended up within my bow range, but I'd identified him as a buck I wanted to let grow another year. It's extremely rewarding when your strategy pays off, and I really enjoyed that hunt. If you would like to stay on top of our hunting strategies throughout each week of the deer season, please subscribe to the Growing Deer channel and share the link with your friends. Watching deer behavior is just one way to enjoy creation, but the best way to have a relationship with the creator is to slow down, be quiet, and listen to him daily. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.